Friends, welcome back to another Pints with Jack Skype session, where, as always, I am joined by my dear friend, David. David. Hello. Thanks for Greetings. joining me. Cheers. Greetings. So we've, we had a Patreon episode released. We have next week a interview of a guest. So I actually haven't had to edit these in a couple times. Therefore, this whole like looking over here to for this you to slide in, I still have not seen if I'm looking the right direction yet. <laughs> so I might have four okay. of these in a row incorrect. But anyways, this was a very fun session of recording our podcast. That's an interesting choice of words since these are the Skype sessions. But we just finished recording our episode of chapter 18 and 19 of Till We Have Faces. And there was a lot of good stuff in here with false self, true self. I in, enjoyed a good bit of this. Actually, some of this related to a talk I just gave. But before I share anything that stuck out to me, I want to hear what really stuck out to you that we could maybe dive into a little bit more deeply from our own personal perspectives. Okay. Well, in the last chapter, I compared it to the latest terrible Star Wars movies where Orwell is like Kylo Ren. She's like Ben Solo, where he puts on this mask in an attempt to become who he wants to be, which is this evil Sith Lord. Uh, in the episode we've just recorded, in the chapters we've just read, I was thinking of a different movie. I was thinking of The Lord of the Rings, where you have Gollum and Smeagol arguing with each other. So for those of you who haven't seen the movies or read the books, firstly, shame on you. <laughs> but secondly, Gollum is, well, his name is Smeagol. He was one of the river folk, much like a hobbit. But through the corrupting power of the ring, he became Gollum. And over the course of the movies, you see him arguing with himself, almost like he's got two different personalities. And one of these characters has hope and love and trust. And the other one, all the opposite of that. He's vengeful and evil. And that was what I was put in mind of when I read what Orwell writes about her own internal monologue, about her desire to kill Orwell, to kill herself, and instead to take on this persona of the queen, this one who is veiled, this one who is strong, this one who cannot be hurt. Because this, this seems to be her conclusion from the hurt that she's received, that the best way to not be hurt again is to love nothing, and to present nothing but a strong face, or in this case, a strong veil, uh, to the outside world. This was the exact thing that stuck out to me. And listeners, David and I do not sync up before we talk about this. I can't <laughs> emphasize the lack of preparation that Matt does for these videos. <laughs> That's because the first ones I prepared for, and I tried to drive the conversation, and it worked. But I like free-flowing conversations better. We, we drive this Lazy. podcast... We, we drive the podcast significantly, so it's nice to have this one a little bit less driven. That's what I tell myself. But this is the same thing for me. So I just, David, you know this, I just got done giving a talk at Notre Dame on somewhat the false self, true self journey towards authenticity. And this has been a big part of my life, partly through Lewis, but also through that quarterly retreat. I go to this quarterly retreat in Chicago and... It's all about going from your false self to your true self. So this is, I love that this is coming up in this book as well. And in this chapter, I think, I love how you said that she tries to kill Orwell and put it to death and then put on this queen. Well, the false self is so much these behavioral patterns that we put on to essentially hide the hurts, the wounds, the shames, the part of ourselves we don't like, and to put on this exterior self that we believe the world will like. If I had to try to summarize this very simply, and in my talk, I called the, the part of me that I was trying to hide Little Maddie Bush because I was actually called Little Maddie Bush in high school because I was so small and it was pretty tough. And I put on this false self. But what particularly stood out to me in this chapter was how as she's trying to put this to death, it's working to some degree. She's winning love. I actually love that at the end of this battle she does as a queen, he goes, blessed, blessed, queen, warrior, the great smart one. He praises her for all the things that she has actually put on to win praise. And I think in my own life, when I've done that, you get the praise, you feel like it's working. But what you'll realize is there'll be moments in life where that other part that you thought you put to death will come back up. 
And there was multiple of those occasions in this chapter where she, she speaking as the queen, says, and then Orwell came back up. And at one point, she even says, the little child. Because it's a typically like this part where we feel small and worthless. And, and vulnerable. Yes, and vulnerable, which connects to other conversations we've had on these Skype sessions with Brene Brown in The Power of Vulnerability and Shame. And so I am really liking how this is all coming together. And you also see how she ends up killing herself, killing Orwell. And it's very often through cataloging all of the wrongs which have been done to her, real or perceived, and thinking the worst about everything, about how people view her. And she thinks that, well, in, in this chapter, she frees the fox because he was a slave. So since she knows that she might die in a couple of days, she grants him his freedom so that if she does die, he can leave Gloam. And she's in horrified to find out that he might actually go back to the Greeklands, yeah. abandon her, leave her. And she enters into this, into this monologue in her head where she starts saying, well, he would have stayed for Psyche. What, why did you ever think that he really loved you in the way that you love him? And she does this with each of the people in her life to build up uh, this, this, this case that the world, that her, her friends, the people around her, the gods, that they all hate her. And therefore, she must put to death Oral and be the queen instead, because that's how she's not going to get hurt. That negative monologue, that negative narrative that we have in our heads. I'm so glad you brought that up because I would be intrigued if you were to go back to, in my talk, I argued that a big part of my false self was developed out of my time in high school and feeling really small and feeling unloved. But if you were to actually survey all of the other people and their thoughts of you, none of them were thinking those negative thoughts. So much of it is in your head. We ha and then confirmation bias, we find certain events that, yes, in that moment, you actually might have been unloved, but then you start creating this intense narrative and you blow it mm -hmm. way out of proportion. And I remember a very defining moment in my spiritual journey was actually at a retreat in St. Bridget's where a speaker came and actually put it in the context of Satan speaking lies to you and how you need to counter them with truth. And I went and wrote 10 lies I've told myself, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. And how those have been things that have constantly played in my head for so long. And I wrote them out and said, these are lies, name them and say, but the truth is this. And that really mm. helps work through that negative narrative that's building up this false self. Yeah, there's actually even a couple of times in the chapters that we read that I couldn't help but hear the voice of screw tape as mm. she's as we're hearing her interior monologue and her reasoning. You 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 hear Uncle Screw Tape from C. S. S. Lewis's book, The Screw Tape Letters, uh, that there is clearly a distortion happening, or at the very least, uh, a, a very a, it's that confirmation bias that you spoke about, the very selectively choosing these things as examples of how people don't love her. And we've commented as we've gone through the book that you keep seeing these little traces of, well, clearly Hubie loves her, clearly the fox loves her, clearly Bardia mm -hmm. loves her. But the point with Orwell is it's never enough and it's not in the way that she wants it because she doesn't want to just receive it. She wants to be able to control it. And I'll say bringing this full circle. So we've been talking about this false self. We've been talking about these negative narratives, how we put on this, self to win the love of the world. The big thing that I learned in that I, on my spiritual journey and was the focus of the talk was the true self. You can't find it by looking for it. Lewis stresses this so much. If you want to find your true self, you have to go to Christ seeking Christ alone. You can't go to Christ hoping to find your authentic self. He'll give or for you what it, he can do for you. Or for what he can do for you. He'll give you it indirectly. But you have to go to him purely. And also, you have to go to him. I should have said that in the beginning, meaning he also argues you can't even find your true self apart from Christ. And Lewis goes on about how when we do that, we become more authentically ourselves. And for me, when I was looking at this, I'm always thinking to myself, okay, well, how do we go to Christ and how do we receive him? And Lewis talks about that good infection, the fountain. We've got to be careful not to bring in too many topics here, but these are all from mere Christianity and getting close to him and bringing him into your life. And that was 
the reason I bring this up is that revolutionized things for me because for years prior to this, I had already identified my false self. Henry Nouwen really showed this to me. But then I started reading all of these great thinkers asking myself, well, how do I figure out who I am? Let me read all these authors. Let me read these books. Not realizing it's not an intellectual exercise. You can't will yourself to your true self. You can't think yourself to your true self. You can surrender yourself to Christ and then you'll get it. And that was hard for me as an intellectual type A person to accept because everything before was self-sufficiency. Just give me the test. Tell me what to study and I'll get the A. Give me the roadmap. Tell me what to do and I will get my true self. That's not how it works. All of those other identities are ones that you make yourself, not the mm -hmm. one that you simply receive. At church this morning, we had the reading because we're coming up to Lent now, and we have the reading of the prodigal son. And I'm sure most people here know the story that the son takes everything, takes his inheritance, goes to a different country, wastes it all, lives a terrible life. And when he's hungry, when he realizes that this life sucks, he realizes he'd be better off at his father's home just being a simple servant. And so he rehearses this little speech. He heads back towards home. And scripture says while he was still a long way off, the father sees him, runs to him, which dignified people did not do, runs to him, falls upon him, throws his arms around him, and doesn't even listen to the little speech that was prepared, and instead reinstates him with his identity, which is that of a son. That's what it means when sandals are put on his feet, a ring is put on his finger, uh, uh, robes are put upon him. It's because he's welcomed back as a son. It's nothing that he could have ever earned, but it's given to him by the father. I was smiling so much when you said the return of the prodigal son, because halfway through my talk, a, a portion of it was Henry Nouwen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And he talks all about what you just said. And he says your true self is your home, is the word he uses, is that place where you hear the voice of God that says, you are my beloved, on you my favor rests. And once we realize this, the whole spiritual journey is about becoming the beloved, which is exactly what you said, because that statement was used in conjunction with Jesus Christ when he, out of his baptism, he hears that he is the beloved and on him his favor rests. Then, as Lewis talks about, we are supposed to become like Christ, sons of God. And so that same identity that he got, we get. And that's the whole journey. Yeah, we keep trying to do what the older brother in the prodigal son story what he does, he treats his father like his boss. He complains that grace is given to his younger brother who messed up and then lists out all of the good things that he's done and says, but you know, you gave me nothing. And the father tries to, tries to communicate with him and says, you're my son, you're with me always. Everything that I have is yours. He said, but this son, this brother of yours, because he referred to him as this son of yours, this brother of yours, he was dead and is now alive. And of course we had to celebrate. But it's being able to trust in the goodness of the father, rather than thinking that this is something that we're just going to simply be able to earn and therefore justify ourselves with. Trust in that goodness. I like that. Let's end with that. This has been fun, David. I love doing these. This is great. I love these unscripted, free-flowing, no-planning talks. He does love the no-planning. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, David.